It's time! Hey, Dave, listen up, please. Scotty, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I got a question for you, though, Scotty. You know uh, that there's other players on our team besides Desi. But what are you waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing. Jones for three. And he banks it in. Bailey. Up and in and a chance for three. Well, welcome in to the basketball podcast of Mid America. Seth Campbell, no Scotty Borderline this time. Uh, you're stuck with me, but you don't get just me. You get the also the head women's basketball coach at the University of Arkansas, Mike Neighbors. Mike, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Hey, thanks for inviting me a time when Scotty's not going to be there, man. This is awesome. Yeah. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> just, just, just teasing. Just teasing. Tell Scotty he's he's on the line for the next one. Okay. Well, we'll make sure to do that. Well. Yeah. With it being baseball season, and I know you're a pretty big baseball fan and, and really Razorback fan about anything, but I heard from through the grapevine um, that you tried out at the University of Arkansas for a Norm DeBryan team. Is this true? Uh, try out is a very loose terminology for what they used to be back then, but uh, it is absolutely the truth. There was a day where... Coach DeBryan allowed, uh, you know, people that were already enrolled at the university to come out and, you know, try out their – obviously scholarships were very limited, basically trying out for a walk-on spot or two. Um, and I did. I went out. I played uh, for a, a, a junior college coach in, at University of Arkansas at Fort Smith that knew Coach DeBryan very well. Uh, coach Crowder, was he, he was a longtime friend. And although I didn't, didn't play um, – uh, a lot uh, after spring ball. I just played spring ball my first year uh, at West Ark. I still had a love for it. And anytime there was an opportunity to be a Razorback, I was taking, I was going to take a shot at it. So, yeah, I, I showed up out there at, uh, at the park, George Cole Field, right by the, uh, right by the Hopper building back in the day and, and gave it my best shot. What was that like? Um, I thought I, I thought I had a great day. Yeah, you know, in my eyes, Seth, I would tell you, I was on fire. Played about as good as I've ever played. I hit it hard in the, my batting. I ran fast. I was making some plays in the middle of the end. I'd never really even been on turf before in my life, uh, and I loved it. Got true hops. I was I was feeling good. I thought I'd had a great day, uh, but Coach DeBrian and staff had a different had a different uh, evaluation, probably probably the correct evaluation too. So, um, but he, um, I, I still remember the the him walking out there to me. I was I'd done, I was done. I was done with what I was you know signed up to do and stayed around like all good walk ons would do to shag some balls as the other people were trying out. Uh, and I was kind of standing out there close to, on the bucket. <clears throat> behind behind a screen, right behind second base, I was just shagging balls. Here comes Coach DeBrian walking out. I mean, it's you know it's probably first of August. Uh, he still got his jacket on like it was the middle of December. He's got his hands in his pocket, and I'm thinking he's coming to tell me I've not only not only have I made the team, but he's probably going to name me a scholarship player, probably a starter after the performance I put on. Uh, but instead, he said uh, he said neighbors. He goes, have you ever thought about going into coaching? And I said, yeah, coach. I said, I, I'm going to be a coach. You know, I, it, I didn't initially think I wanted to be. I thought I was going to be a vet. But, you know, now I'm, I'll definitely be in coaching someday. And he said, uh, okay. He goes, um, I said, as soon as my career's over, I said, whenever I wrap up doing what I'm doing, I'm going to go into coaching. And he kind of took one of his hands out of his pocket, patted me on the shoulder. He said, uh, he said, Mike, that day's today. <laughs> Put his hand in his pocket and walked off. Uh, and uh, we've talked about it and laughed about it uh, a number of times since. But he was spot on. Allowed me to <clears throat> allowed me to go into college knowing I was – baseball career, the ball was flat for me, basketball and baseball. So time to get on with my real life. And it was uh, – it, now I was de as devastated as I was. It, he did the right thing and uh, helped me. Uh, get started my coaching career a little earlier than I thought I would have. 
So basically, it's Norm DeBryan launched your coaching career in a way. Absolutely. I think we've come full circle. He Every time I see him, he, he live, we live out kind of close to each other, and I see him and his wife walking the dogs, and um, it, it still comes up from time to time. But he, uh, he, he always says, oh, yeah, I remember how you hit it hard. If we'd have had a spot, I know he's just trying to make me feel good now because he's seen so many great players uh, over his time. There, there's no way. I know he's got a great memory, but – um, it's a funny story, but he definitely is uh, a small piece of my, uh, of, of my Arkansas, uh, years at Arkansas. Well, that is a great story, Mike, and, and a great yeah. start to the podcast. Uh, speaking of great players, you had quite a few on your team this year, and really this was the first time at the University of Arkansas since you've been here, that your team's had some expectations going into the season. How do you think and how did you handle that as the coach? Uh, I probably didn't handle it very well as a coach. <clears throat> I look back now and I had, up until this time in my career, I've been very prideful of us keeping things in perspective and making sure we're knocking down that domino right in front of us, not not trying to skip one because then the rest of them don't get knocked down if you take one out. Ben, that's just been something I've really prideful of and, and try to focus on. And I think I let some of those expectations catch up <clears throat> in the way that we viewed some things. And uh, I, I didn't want it to. I don't, I don't think our team did. I think they showed up and worked like we were picked last still, uh, even though we weren't. So maybe, you know, I, I will always beat myself up over that, have some regret that, I didn't get them to the finish line this year like we have in the past when we've been the underdogs. I, I don't think we peaked at the right time. I think we peaked a little early. Um, and, you know, that that comes to my desk. Why In the past, if, if we were going to try to say what we did work to peak us at the right time, we, we did it wrong this time. So uh, I would never use COVID as an excuse, but it was obviously something very, very brand new for every single person to deal with. And, uh, as well as we navigated some of those things, uh, I, I do think we peaked too early. Uh, thus, the you know February win versus UConn and December win with Bay, all those guys. Uh, we didn't play our best basketball late, so I'll always have a, a kind of a what if um, feeling about the year. Uh, we didn't, you know, because of COVID, we didn't get an opportunity to host the NCAA tournament, which we would have as a four seed. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's reality. Um, and I will always look back at it as something that could have been, but also be very, very proud that it was, that we even got to play it, that we did all those things and, and got to have the season and every, every player, uh, stayed healthy. Uh, we kept them from uh, a number of things. I think they mentally uh, managed the year. I just, I just don't think we had the NCAA tournament run that we'd hoped, but, but that's that domino again, because of the expectation we probably should have still just had the expectation to go win a game, not win the whole tournament. And I think we got a little ahead of ourselves there, but now we've got that out of the way for the future. Uh, we'll learn from that, that error in judgment on my part. And hopefully that won't happen to us again, because I think expectations will continue to be high now that we've been to back to back or would have been without COVID NCAA tournaments and kind of raise the expectations. We're okay with that now. Uh, we've got that domino back in place, and I think with this future team, um, we'll use those experiences as lessons rather than uh, look back on them with regret. You mentioned peaking kind of at the right, the wrong time, or what you thought was peaking at the wrong time. What were some of the things that you thought kind of factored into that? <clears throat> peaking at the wrong time? I, I think just the, the way we changed our focus, you know, the way we implemented our offense and our defensive schemes. Uh, probably put some stuff in too early. Um, probably had too long of a practice, you know, during that time of the year or started to cut back a little bit uh, in some areas, the wrong areas. Uh, changed our focus and uh, kind of lost sight of the finish line, you know. And then I, I think we all are, are guilty of this, or I have been in my life and my teams. It's a little bit easier to deal with adversity than it is success. Mm. And I – and. That may not be true, but it's the way I feel. It's, it's been our experience um, that, you know, when you have people patting you on the back and ranking you in the top 10 and, and putting you as ESPN this or ESPN that, 
it's really, really hard when it's the first time in a long time not to enjoy that too much. So I think that was one of the things. I think some tactics, like I mentioned, were was the second thing. And then the third thing, I think, was fatigue. Um, and those were all things brought upon by us traveling the day of a game rather than going down the night before. That That probably had a little bit more stress than I thought that it would. Uh, and I probably, looking back now, may have overestimated um, some of those things. Maybe we could have gone and stayed in a hotel. A lot of people did and, and pulled it off successfully. Uh, probably should have done some things differently that way. I, I just think we got, and I don't necessarily mean physical fatigue. I, I think we were in great shape. But I think the mental challenges that um, the summer caused for us and then the challenges of travel – I just think it. I think we hit the wall earlier than you normally do in in late March, early April. We hit it in you know February instead. When you you mentioned earlier that you didn't want us COVID to be an excuse, but when you're dealing with that, take us just kind of behind the scenes a little bit of like what was the day to day like for your team that may have been different from normal when you were dealing with a global pandemic and still trying to play basketball? I'll just take you through a day. I, I, I would lay in my bed until eight thirty, and, and just wait for that phone call to say, well, you're all clear. Um, you know, it was before I'd pop up and do things and be around, but it was just kind of this, Hey, if, if you don't get a call by eight thirty, you're good. So let's go. But if you got one of those calls, and you're up and around, it just completely changes your day because you weren't going to be able to go to the office or able to practice. So you were waiting for that test result to come back. And that wears on you a little bit. So the, your very thing, your very first thought every morning was, is Coach Todd going to call me because Dave England has called him? So that's the number one thing. The other thing is – even though you passed that 8.30 deadline or that 8.30 time, whatever you had on your to-do list, there's a good chance it was going to be blown up by lunch because of something that came that's, that impacted either your opponent, uh, somebody, your future opponent, uh, somebody on your staff, somebody on your support staff, one of your players. Um, my to-do list changed, and I'm a big lister, as we've all talked about a lot of different times, but it became an empty note card of let's just see what's next and, and handle things as they're coming. Cause if you get this plan together, it was no more often than not shot. So that was a challenge. Just the, again, the physical nature of um, not being around each other. We couldn't come to the house and have cookouts. We couldn't go to a movie together. Uh, we didn't, you know, if, if we were on a plane, we had to sit so far apart from each other. Uh, practices, get away from each other. I mean, it just it, it just had so many of your focuses turned from read the ball screen to uh, get away from her so y'all don't catch COVID or you don't get caught in contact tracing. Even though we may have had a lot of kids who weren't, not even, we still could have been contact. So it, it just took, you know, we only have so much energy. And so much energy of our, of our day went into surviving the day and being healthy and avoiding the virus that not only affected you personally, but it affected everybody else on our team. If you get sick you, and I rode in a car with Coach Todd, then that affects his day. Then his kids have got to separate from their dad. And, and, and his wife has got to take care of the kids for two weeks. It just really put a burden that I don't think anybody can uh, that didn't go through it can really fully understand. And I don't think we'll ever fully explain it, but our, our lives turned from being a uh, full-time basketball coach, full-time counselor, half-time psychologist to, to just trying to follow and find the best form of the information to make the best decisions you could for your kids and your team. Um, and it was an everyday, all day thing at times. So uh, I, again, not using it as an excuse because every single person had to deal with it. It was just how you were able to manage it. Uh, and, and, and it put the kids in the best possible chance to stay healthy. It was always that final filter, which meant no film room, uh, watch it on your own, no locker room, 
uh, we didn't have a locker room all year. So there's just so many things that it could have been. Uh, I will, we will never know what it all was, but it was just an accumulation of all those things. Um, and then the unknown of not having anybody rely on. I couldn't call Coach Blair and say, hey, Coach. I mean, I did call him because he was the closest one ever to living it through the last pandemic uh, <laughs> that was a coach. And I've said that to him face to face. But, I mean, he's not even been through that. So there was nobody out there to call and get advice. You, know, you can talk to your friends and ask what they were doing, but their situations were all different. They lived in different parts of the country. So the battle for information and then, you know, who to best believe. I put my trust in Hunter Yurichek and Greg Sankey. Uh, whatever they – I felt like they were getting the best information possible. And if they told us something about COVID, that's who I believed. I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't watch CNN. I didn't watch – Fox News. I didn't read Twitter about it. So, um, I mean, I, I think 10 years from now, somebody's going to have done a great study on on the effects of this, but we won't know until then. I think you mentioned uh, talking to some of the people that have been toward you or, or, you know, that are your friends in the coaching industry. And I think you said during the middle of the season that, you know, like, like you just said, that there there's nobody that's been through this, but you said that you were keeping notes in case it ever happened again. <laughs> um, what are some, of you know, I, you know, whether you actually wrote them down in a notebook or just oh. some of the t- takeaways, what were some of those takeaways that you, that you learned from this? <clears throat> well, the number one thing I learned is that information is the number one key. Um, providing that information to kids and people because in the absence of information, it is human nature for your brain to automatically think negatively, to go to the worst case scenario immediately. Uh, And that was always the case. If if you didn't know something, you felt it was bad. You, You didn't feel like it was good news they were keeping from you. So the number one thing is I'm going to be a way better I'm going to be an over communicator, an over giver. You're going to have stuff that you're going to get sick of getting, but you're going to have information and and you can take that information and, and use it to come to the conclusions in your own mind, but not providing the information immediately led to negativism. Mm-hmm. I looked up why y'all can do all your own research on it, but it's a, it goes back to the first, first time man walked the face of the earth. And if you and I, Seth, were walking down a, a place where we were still being a, you know, or we had people, a predator, you know, after us, whether you think it's tigers or lions or woolly mammoths or Tyrannosaurus rexes, there was something that was after human beings for a while. We weren't the top of the, we weren't the top of the food chain. And at that time, if you and I were walking, let's just say we're in, in on the Serengeti, me and you were walking and we heard a rustle in the woods, in the bushes. If you thought it was the wind, and stayed there, and I thought it was a tiger, and I ran off. Guess who lived? <laughs> Not me. Me. You get. You thought it was the wind because you're optimistic. Oh, it's just the wind. Oh, wait, I was wrong. It was a saber tooth tiger. You know, and I'm gone, and I live. Well, that brain, that part of my brain, is what continued to survive. So it's just human nature. I know I did it. My, you know, if if my daughter's five minutes late for a curfew, growing up my mind in five minutes would go from she's probably just running a little late to she's in the back of somebody's trunk uh, in a foreign country getting ready to be trafficked Mm. because I thought I've seen taken too many times, you know, but in in my head, I'll become Liam Neeson character all of a sudden getting ready to have to go down and hunt my daughter down uh, because she got kidnapped in five minutes. Um. But that's, you know, just to find out she was driving a bunch of drunk people home. Okay, great. I should have had better thoughts, but I didn't. It goes negative in the form of lack of information. So a long answer to tell you I'm going to over-communicate with people because I think that caused as much harmful, long-lasting damage to people than the virus may have in the long run. Mm. Uh, I know people lost their lives. I know there are a lot of people that are still sick. But I think we're going to have a lot of people in these next 10 years that, you know, they're calling it the cave syndrome. You know, we've been used to being in our caves for the last, you know, 12 months. There's some people apprehensive about coming out of their caves, and I've seen it. I've felt it. Um, I, You know, so I, I know what's happening. 
but provide people with information, make sure people know you're there, care about them, write them letters, just com- over communicate. Um, and that's, uh, that's the biggest thing. That'll be the biggest thing I take away and put in all the other things are all just little things, tactics, you know, like, you know, the way we did travel, maybe, maybe we, we tweak some things there, but the big takeaway is make sure you're checking on your loved ones, your family, your friends, uh, and communicate with anybody that looks to you uh, as a leader. Move away a little bit now from the pandemic talk and just talk about the season that you had. Um, obviously, I think everybody's mind when they think where they're going to think of this 2020, 2021 season and this team is going to go to that UConn game. And yeah. a lot of people have covered, you know, how that came about and in the short time. But from your perspective, when, you know, you had your team and they wanted to schedule the best and, and you knew all these things, but from your perspective, ha- was there ever a moment of like, man, should we do this? Is this the <laughs> right move? And like, did I really just bring in like the perennial power in women's basketball to come play us? What, was there ever a moment? <laughs> uh, yeah, there were tons of them, believe me. Um, leading up to it, especially, and then up until up until tip off. I mean, I was still looking at Todd, going uh, as soon as that ball went in the air. I was like, I hope this goes like we hoped it would. You know, um, yeah, there was a lot of, and, and it came from everywhere. I mean, Hunter tells you, you know, when I called to talk to him about, it, he was like, "Do what? <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna replace Vanderbilt with who?" Um, but it was who our team was, and and I'm gonna tell you this. If we hadn't have done it, I, I think I think it would have just completely shot. It would have made us – our credibility would have been shot. And uh, that's what I kept coming back to. The kids wanted it. We really wanted it. We thought it was a great deal. We knew that we were capable. Did a million things have to line up? Was there some luck? Is there some randomness involved? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. But – if you don't stick to what you say you were going to do, man, these kids see it. Uh, your administration would see it. Your boosters would see it. And, and your, your credibility now when you stand up and tell them, they're not going to believe you anymore. So we had to make it happen. Uh, like you said, we've covered how it came about. But, no, there were many conversations uh, leading up to, especially when you start watching the pregame, you know, the scout film, and you start talking to Coach Todd about matchups, and we're going – Okay, who's got – okay, that leaves – okay. I mean, and you're just – you look at – you know they're 11-time national champs. Um, we're, then, then you realize, oh, wait a second. We're playing them on the anniversary of Kobe's death, and they're going to be wearing gear specifically given to them by Nike that Kobe inspired, you know, and you're just like going – it just kept getting worse. I mean, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, like – what else are they going to throw at us, you know? Um, but our kids, you now you go back and you look at it and you think of all the positive things that did come out of it. Um, I don't think Chelsea makes the All-American team if we don't play that game. Um, not only because – just because of our performance against them. Hmm. Uh, it carried weight with all those people that voted to, to put 38 on them to find out that that was the most points a player had scored against them in like 25 years. And we scored 90 as a team, which was the most that anybody had scored on a UConn team this century. Then Mario does what Mario does and says there's only nine other teams that have beaten them this century. And you're like, your minds just start spinning. Um, but, yeah, we'll always remember that game uh, for a lot of good reasons. Uh, I, I wish it would have happened in the, you know, in the final four, um, beating, that, beating them, but uh, ha- or to go to the final four. Um, but having it in Bud Walton will always have a specialness to it as well. And even though on the timeline it fell at the in the kind of toward the the end of the middle, um, it, it won't diminish uh, the impact it's had on our program. That's for sure. Has it sunk in? Still not. No, I don't remember what we were doing the other day. Uh, we were watching it. Came up on somebody posted some clips. Uh, independent person had posted some clips of some of the actions we ran during the game. And, you know, you got to start getting feedback from it. And no, it's still, you still look at that score and you go, is this, I, I know we're ahead by 11, but 
are we, do we still win this game? You know, you're just wondering, uh, is, was it all, you know, uh, something that you built up in your head or did it really happen? So it still will be something like say, we try to, we'll try to put behind us, but I think we're going to have to be talking about it for a long time. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> I am sure that, you know, you might from your scouting and stuff have known, but for me and not just keeping up just a ton with UConn women's basketball, that really felt like a coming out party for Paige Beckers. And then from then on, she just had a fantastic season. Um, and it kind of started against y'all and y'all were able to still overcome that. Yeah, she had, uh, you know, she had played well up into that point, but not, not like she did for the rest of the year. I, I and I've talked to coach REM a few times since then. I think he got a lot of coachable moments with his team after that. I think before that, you know, they hadn't really been faced with a, a, a ranked team. I think he had been trying to tell his kids they, they needed to keep practicing harder. And I, from him to tell, and the only reason I know is because he told me that. He said, from that point on, we never had to coach effort. All he would have to do was, hey, remember that trip we took to Arkansas? And he said it was, it was over. So – uh, yeah, she had a tremendous freshman year, and it, it did. It, it kind of got going against us, and, you know, from that point on, I, you know, some people had her as National Player of the Year. Uh, I think that's a, a big burden to put on a freshman, but she was certainly one of the, the top players in the country and, and certainly will be for a few years to come. Well, looking forward a little bit to next year, you've kind of built this team, the, the team that you had since your time that you got there, and you built it, you built it, and then you were very senior-laden in 2020, 2021. You know, this year you almost get to start over, but you do get Amber Ramirez back. You get some other pieces back as well, um, not to take away from Michaela Daniels or anybody right. like that. Um, but just what is – I know it's super early in – the makeup of a team, but what is some of the things that you can look out for on this team next year? Oh, we're going to be a lot longer. You know, I, you know, it's been well documented, the lack of our size. Um, you know, we could have gone out and probably signed a six, four kid someplace in the last couple of years, but it wouldn't have fit the style that we were playing. And I was not about to, to take our style and change it with Chelsea and destiny and, Taylor and Grace and Macy and Jalen and all of our seniors. Um, I'm not going to change that. We brought them here to build this, and they were doing that. So we changed a little bit now. We get a little bit longer. You know, you add, you add some length and you add size. I, I've never cared how tall somebody's top of their head was. And until we start rebounding with the top of our head, all I'm going to care about is how long they are uh, and how high they can jump and reach. Uh, and, and how maneuverable they are. But we added that with Emory Ellis and Jersey and Ashland Sage. Th these are all long kids. You know, Alana Eaton set out really long athletic. Uh, you know, Marquisha Davis started to come into her own. Aaron Barnum got a lot of playing time. So I really like the nucleus. <coughs> you know, then the summer you get to add Sasha uh, back into uh, that lineup, a, a kid who got a lot of valuable experience at Oregon State and, in the Pac-12, and now she gets to come home to Fayetteville. So I think you're going to see a team with a little more depth. Um, I, as a head coach, have never, ever played more than seven or eight kids, you know, valuable minutes in close games. I think that's going to change. Uh, you can see us pressing uh, at times in time and score situations. Uh, the offense will still function fast. Uh, we'll, we'll focus on not turning it over, and we'll play quick. Um, you know, threes will always be a huge part of what we do, but I do think we'll be able to go inside and get tough buckets around the rim uh, with a variety of people in a variety of ways. So to me, that's the way the blueprint is supposed to work. You, you, you get the foundation laid, you put up a few walls, and, you know, now you start really fine-tuning. You start getting specific, kind of like building that house. The slab's about the same and the, the framing's about the same, but the house starts to take shape when you start picking out uh, textures and uh, floor coverings and wall coverings. That That's kind of where we're at now. Uh, we're adding specific types of players, specific pieces uh, to try to build on what we've got started. When you look at the women's game now, what has changed about the women's game from when you started coaching to where it is at right now? Uh, the skill development, you know, it's uh, the, the things that Every single player can do now. Uh, just the overall general size. I mean, back in the day, 6'3 was 
uh, a, you know, a, a really big, really tall for our game. You know, now there's rosters that have seven or eight of those kids. Um, so the athleticism, the the focus on nutrition, recovery, um, really has changed our game. I I think that uh, it's it's made it um, for me. Uh, it's made it so enjoyable to coach because we're still not at the point where a, a dunk is a part of our play. So you got to be strategic in your in your offense and your defense. There are a few people that dunk it. And every now and then we get a few in the game, and it makes Sports Center when it happens. But you know the game is still very, very uh, relied upon some strategies and tactics. And uh, but I think those have improved. I think the quality of the game, you know, there's there's not a bunch of jump balls and turnovers. Uh, and is our game will always be about engagement. I know that, but I, I think we're getting closer to that entertainment value as well. Uh, not only in college, but now in the WNBA in year 25. Um, it's it's a very, very healthy sport. Uh, and I, I think you've got a lot of places that, that make it important. And it's important here. It's obviously important in the SEC and this part of the country. So um, it's been good to see a, an opportunity for these uh, young ladies to become young women and have an opportunity to make it a career. You know, seeing seeing what a couple of our recent kids have been able to do with, you know, Chelsea signing with the Jordan brand and she and Slocum fighting tooth and nails right now to make a roster uh, on the WNBA. They're both obviously going to go play overseas. Uh, and now they're fighting to, to, I think, make the toughest league in the world. It, the WNBA is the hardest job to get in pro sports. And those two kids will find out on Thursday. But uh, they've been doing great. I mean, uh, it, it's – the game is a lot healthier. There's a there's a lot more interest in it, and and I think it gives these kids a, an avenue uh, once college is over. Want to kind of wind it down here? I got a section. Uh, I'm going to tease for you. There's just like a, a few right. rapid fire questions for you. But All before right. Right. before we get to those, uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about. You said to me last year that. Uh, getting drafted in the WNBA is the second hardest thing to do in women's basketball with the only harder thing is to make the Olympic team. Yeah. How proud are you that the fact that you got two ladies drafted in the <laughs> same year? It was awesome. Uh, and, and I throw Ari in there too, you know, Ari McDonald. Um, I coached her. I signed her uh, at Washington uh, she played for us as a freshman before I left to come back to Arkansas. So I, I, I feel for Chelsea and, and Destiny, obviously, for the Razorbacks, but Ari was a third player. It, it, it's the proud Papa feeling, you know. The You were a small, very, 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 very small portion of all their success, and, and you got to enjoy it. But just to see them, you know, fulfill those dreams of hearing their name called, putting on the hat, and getting a jersey, and, you know, now going to be – side by side with people that were their idols. It's one of the very, very small rewards that we get uh, and was very prideful uh, for those, those two Razorbacks. And then, then also with Ari. All right, Mike, here we go. Rapid fire right. segments. I'm so ready. just answer as long as you want yep. to, but uh, just some few things that, you know, might yep. be a little interesting. Go. All right. What's the, uh, one place or venue you want to either play or coach basketball in that you haven't yet? That I have not? That you have not. Okay. It would be someplace with USA basketball playing for a medal, wherever that is. Okay. Um, best thing you've watched on TV this year? Not even close. Ted Lasso. Oh, my. Not even close. Goodness. Hands down, the best thing on TV, maybe, maybe ever but certainly since the West Wing was put out. Oh, my goodness. Ted Lasso is fantastic. Um, amazing. I've watched it about eight times. Can't wait for season two. All right. One rule you wish you could add to women's college basketball? Uh, I would like to see no fouls. No fouling out. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just – I would like – and this may take a little bit longer. Sorry. but No, go for it. it we, we are the only sport whose best player can be – taken out of the game by the officials for not, for not doing anything egregious. Mm. They can, can, our players, if they get two or three fouls early, they're out of the game. If they get a sixth, fifth foul, they have to come out no matter what. 
but the left tackle can make 70, 75 holding penalties. But it's up to the coach to keep playing them or not playing them. So I would love to devise a system in which we could play. <clears throat> the co- it would come back to the coaches. So, like, maybe on the sixth foul, the t- other team gets a point in the ball. On the seventh foul, they get two points in the ball. On the eighth foul, they get – I don't know. Make it really penalizing, but at least allow us to make that decision as to whether or not those players should, should stay on the floor. I know it's kind of drastic, but I, I got a dream to make that happen at some point, other than in basketball camps that we host. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Along the same lines, that was a w- rule you wish you could add, one rule you could wish you could take away? Block charge. I think it should be an automatic block. If if you if you have not kept the defender from going toward the basket, it should be a block every time. Okay. Moving on now, what's the appropriate amount of time to talk to an official about a call? Appropriate or, <laughs> or what I do? <laughs> uh, what you do. Uh, appropriate would be zero. You should probably not say anything. They got a tough job. I know how hard it is. Uh, for me, it's till they make another call that goes in my favor. I'm going to stay on them probably until something goes and it's like, oh, okay, well, now we're even. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't have an exact time for you, but that gives it, that puts it in perspective. There you go. Okay. Favorite thing about the state of Arkansas? That when we stick together, great things happen. Uh, we build Walmart, we build George's, we build Tyson's, we build Dillard's, we build, you know, all the great things. We, we produce Johnny Cash, we produce a, a president. Um, when we stick together and we don't pull each other apart, uh, we don't break each other down, and worldwide things, really, really cool things happen out of Arkansas. Okay, this one might take just a little explaining on my, my part. What's your hottest take? Hot, oh, I hear people talk about this a lot. Like, to be a hot take, does it have to be a little controversial? A little controversial. So, like, I've gotten things of um, somebody said Chick-fil-A is not that good. Uh, somebody else oh. has told me that they don't even like French fries. So, you know, oh. yeah, that, which is a very hot take. But something that you think may be controversial that you believe. Oh, uh, wow. I, that you have, I'm not very rarely stumped. Uh, <laughs> give me, a, give me a second here. I, I can come up with something. Is, okay. Do you have another question? Yeah, for sure. Um, give me another one. Something will pop in my head as we're talking. How hard is it to balance being a dad of a young one and also being a head coach at SEC university? Impossible <laughs> to balance. Can't, can't be good at either one of them. If you don't have rhythm. You know, there's there's days I, I see Bowen for 23 hours. There's days I see him for 30 minutes while he's awake. So there's there's not going to be a balance, but you've got to find the rhythm. So impossible to find a balance, but I, it, I, I am able to find the rhythm because I've got a great support staff and JC's so understanding and she'll bring him to me. Uh, so impossible to balance, but easy to find a rhythm if you've got the right people around and, and understanding and, and then you work at it, you can do it, but it, it does require a lot of work. How has the transfer portal changed college basketball? It's really impacted high school freshmen okay. or seniors the most. Uh, we're going to find ways to adapt, but th- that, that little subset of, of our recruitment window it's completely changed how we go about evaluating a high school's incoming freshman. Um, because, you know, for a fact, every single year there's going to be somebody in the portal that either you recruited, have a good relationship with, might be interested in coming in that's already gone through the freshman experience. So it's really going to change how we look at our freshmen. I think it's also going to really change – you know, the way that we manage our rosters during the season uh, and the way that you're communicating expectations and future potential for every single player down your roster. All right, two more, Mike. This one, uh, I might just stump you and, you know, you might have to go mute uh, here. But okay. um, who are you taking, college Kelsey Plum versus college Chelsea Dungy? Oh, geez. One-on-one or in a team game? Uh, one-on-one. Man, I'm gonna tell you one thing. I would hate to have to officiate that game because <laughs> neither one of them think they've ever fouled. Although Chelsea got better at that as a senior. Uh, I mean, I, 
I'm not sure I can answer it. And and ha- I think if they played ten times, it'd be five to five. Okay. Hey, that's that's a very political a diplomatic, and diplomatic I answer. I liked but that. It's honest though. <laughs> I mean, it really is. I I it, it it would depend on the rules. Are we going by twos and ones? Are we going by threes and twos? Uh, it would certainly depend on the rules. I think they could favor each other. If you if you literally you know made me choose one, and, and I'd say this to Chelsea right now, I'd have to choose Kelsey because of her experience. Yeah. But but give Chelsea three years in the WNBA and playing overseas and you know in USA basketball like like Kels has, and it, it might be a it might be different. But right now, you know, obviously, I I think I, I'd love to see it happen. Uh, but if you made me choose, I'd, I'd probably have to choose have to choose Kelsey, considering uh, all the thing, all the factors. Okay, we're gonna come back to the hot take, but this is the last other one that I have. Um, okay, know that you don't want to single anybody out, but yep. uh, somebody to keep an eye out on for next season right now. That's easy, Marquisha Davis. I, I just think she did what a, a freshman to a sophomore is supposed to do. She filled a role she stayed through the summer she didn't leave like most kids that were in that role would have or have in the past and and i think you're going to see that kid really have a a, her sophomore year which would be her junior year on campus Uh, i think just be watching because if she if she if she shows up like she did last year and works like she did last year um man the sec there's going to be a big sec jump for her all right, and then last okay, I one. I think I got a hot take for you. All right, do it. I'm not – I am I am a running Razorback guy, not a slobbering hog guy. Oh, okay. Is that a good one? That's a good one, yes. I, I know that the slobbering hog, because of the, the years that it was our logo during that, I just, I just honestly think – the running Razorback is as classic as a logo. And I'm saying that as somebody that's worn it all over the country, you know, at Washington. I'll I'll give you a great example. At Washington, we had that script W, block W, you know, Mm -hmm. on our, and that was it. We were literally in the final four in the, in Indiana at Conseco Fieldhouse. I was with my team. They had Washington Huskies on it everywhere. We got onto an elevator, and the elevator operator went, hey, I went to Western Illinois and pointed to my W. <laughs> and I was like, I'm with Washington. Look, we're here. We're, you're taking us to practice. Still, though, they, they identified me with Western Illinois with that W. Not one time in my life have I ever been someplace where somebody didn't see it call the hogs. Like, I, I was in Russia. Somebody walked by. They went, we pick Suey. Uh, you know, Florida, wherever you go, you wear that, you're either going to find a Razorback fan, a, a, an Arkansan, somebody that are, is just a fan of something. It's so iconic. Uh, and I love our other ones. I love the standing A. I love the, I love the slobbering hog. I do. It's my second favorite. But I'm a, I'm a running Razorback guy. I like it. That's good stuff. Well, okay. Mike, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, today. you got it. You bet, man. All right. Well, that was Mike Neighbors, head coach of the University of Arkansas women's basketball team. Uh, really appreciate him joining us for today's listen. If you want to find out more information about women's basketball, about anything Arkansas Razorbacks, you can check us out on wholehogsports.com. Well, for Mike, I am Seth Campbell saying so long. We'll see you back here well, at a later date.